are traveling today. And I pray, God, that you will use uh, these men and women that are hearing your word taught. May they use it with their own people and with the lost that are near them. And we thank you for Brother Privet being able to be over in India with them. And God, I pray uh, you will continue to bless his ministry as the director of VBN Vision 2020 Asia. Use Brother Jim Starr in the different places he's going to be traveling. And I pray as he's over in Manipur that you'll cause him to be used. His souls will be saved and Christians helped and encouraged. And Lord, most of all today, we want to thank you for your so great salvation. And Lord, I pray for anyone that is hearing the word of God uh, through our witness that they would neglect not neglect this so great salvation as Hebrews 2 says. And Lord, today it is great because you gave a great, great sacrifice for us. It's great because you did give it to us in great grace. And Father, I thank you today because it's great to me because you've saved me and you've saved these that are hearing uh, this, thy word today and praying together. When I pray, servants of so great of God, God is salvation. Well, just by way of review, uh, we certainly. The situation where we uh, are going to finish this up. I intended to finish this up last week, uh, but uh, cut short and we just got uh, slowed down. But let's go back and review this doctrine of eternal security and assurance of true believers. Uh, and so the, we mentioned last week there's a difference between sonship, fellowship, and discipleship. Sonship has to do with being members of a family, being born into a family. That it speaks of getting life from God. And this life that he gives to us is eternal. Therefore, it will not stop. It will not end. It cannot be lost. And so sonship has to do with being lifetime members of God's family, and that's eternal life. And so we we gave the passages about that. Fellowship has to do with partaking of the same things that God partakes of. Fellowship literally means to be in a state of partaking with, or sharing with someone else. And so it has to do with our walking in the light as God is in the light. And thus we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, we said, is the one that restores us back into fellowship. If we stop walking in the light as God is in the light and we repent and ask for forgiveness, that cleanses the pollution that has come into our relationship and we're back into a fellowship with God. You can't lose sonship, but you can lose fellowship. And that's why 1 John chapter 1 and 2 talks about the fact that God is holy, and in him is no light or darkness or absence of light, no, no darkness in him at all. And so he walks in truth. He walks in righteousness. He does everything with perfect holiness. We don't always do that, even as believers. And so when we step away from walking in the light, we come and confess our sins. And it says, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He says, I'm writing these things unto you, my little children. These are believers that John had led to the Lord. And he says, 
I write these things unto you, not that you sin, but that you sin not. But if any man sin, he says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So once again, if I get out of fellowship and we need to encourage people in our ministries on a regular basis, if you've gotten out of fellowship with God this week and you haven't made things right with him, you need to get back in fellowship today. Now, if they're already believers, they don't get back into sonship. They get back into fellowship with the Lord. And, you know, just let me ask you men and women today, are you in fellowship? Yeah, how do you know if you're in fellowship? Well, how many sins did you commit yesterday? I think I have a good day if I don't commit more than one, two sins in my thoughts, my attitudes, my actions. I don't know about you, but I feel like I've had a good day if I'm uh, three or less that way. But did you confess three times yesterday if you sinned three times yesterday and ask for fellowship renewal or cleansing of that. And that tells us whether we are to do that. Somebody called it keeping short accounts with God about our sinning as believers. We don't let it go on and on and then five weeks later decide we're going to confess it all. No, we want to stay daily in fellowship, hour by hour, minute by minute. And so we keep short accounts by confessing our sin and God's son's blood cleansing us. He's our advocate and he pleads our case to restore fellowship. You know, Wesley put it this way in his song, John Wesley and Charles Wesley, great hymn writers, five bleeding wounds he bears received on Calvary. Forgive, they cry, forgive, they cry. And so th this is the idea we need to constantly plead the blood of Christ on sin. But then discipleship is has to do not so much with receiving life or walking in the light, but it has to do with wanting to become like my Lord, my master, my master teacher, a learner that is loyal and wants to be like his master. And we saw that in Matthew 10 and Luke 14. Luke 14 is the great discipleship passage. And then we came into this idea of e the definitions of eternal security and three views of this doctrine. And if you remember, we talked about five different terms, eternal uh, security. And we emphasized eternal was the first one. And eternal means forever. And thus it cannot be lost. If it's eternal, it's going to last forever. And then... It, Preservation. Preservation has to do with the idea of keeping someone and both the eternal aspect of our salvation is God's doing. It's God's work to give us eternal life. And then preservation is he keeps us in that eternal life. And that's what preservation is. I use my wife's good strawberry preserves. Uh, we call them jam. Sometimes we call them jelly. But you take strawberries and you cook them up and then you put sugar in them and then you put them in a container and put them in a freezer or a sealed jar and they're preserved and they don't spoil. Well, that's exactly the way our salvation is. It's preserved by God. And then we talked about perseverance and perseverance really has to do with our condition as believers. It means that believers can neither totally or finally fall away from the state of grace. And so we per persevere all the way to the end. We're kept in a condition of preserved in perseverance. So it's a condition of a believer. And then security. Security means something that is secure, that it once again is kept but can't be lost. It's like uh, treasure in a safe, uh, a check or money put in a safe, it's secure. And so it's something that we feel secure about because it is secure. 
and God made it that way. Now, assurance, that's another doctrine in this matter, and it totally has to do with the subjective feelings and thoughts of the believer. And we mentioned that a person can be saved, have eternal security, but not have assurance. There are people for varied reasons do not have assurance. And I told you about my mom. Uh, she said she had been saved when she was a young lady, but she didn't have assurance of her salvation. Paul said about himself, he says, I'm confident of this thing that he which hath begun a good work in us will, yes, perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So he had a confidence, he had an assurance. And he said, I've committed unto God those things that he's able to keep unto that day. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12, Paul talks about that in his own personal salvation. And so we look at, looked at that last week. Then there are three theological views of eternal security. And I want you to remember the difference between these. We gave verses that oftentimes people that believe in the holiness view uh, hold on to for their belief. And this usually involves Armenian theologians, people that believe in the Armenian uh, believe that you can sin away your salvation. In other words, you can get saved and then you commit sin. And then if you don't confess that sin right after or soon, well, you lost your salvation when you sinned. And if you don't get confessed back in to the family of God, so to speak, if you die in that condition, you will die and go to hell. So they believe that you can be saved and lose it is basically what we're talking about. And so that would be the denominations of charismatics usually hold to this position, uh, Methodist, there's Wesleyan Methodist, there's United Methodist, there's a variety of different Methodists, but most of them hold to that. The Nazarene Church, the Church of God, uh, uh, Pentecostal holiness, uh, assembly of God. Recently, I sat at a sporting event of our grandchildren playing. I have two grandsons that are teenagers and they're playing in a volleyball game against another Christian school here in America. And sitting behind me was a man that was uh, cheering for the other team because he had a son playing on the other team. And he was a Pentecostal holiness pastor. Now we had some good time talking with one another, chatting how his ministry was doing, how other churches were in the area were doing, churches I had preached in, in that area where he pastors. And, but I, he would hold to a position of holiness and that they put Pentecostal holiness there. And that tells you that they believe you lose your salvation. The Assembly of God Church historically is held to that position. And so uh, these people oftentimes live in fear and torment because they wonder if they've committed sin and they haven't confessed it, whether they didn't remember the sin, uh, didn't uh, understand it as sin. And so they're living in anxiety that they may be saved today and not lost tomorrow. And if they die tomorrow in a car accident, they're not going to go to heaven. Well, th these people oftentimes live in a great deal of insecurity. They don't have assurance. And the free will position. Well, the free will position is similar in believing that you can go from being saved to unsaved. But they don't believe it's by a sin that you commit. They believe it's by a choice that you make. Now, oftentimes people that have the free will position, uh, they will go to chapter 10 of Hebrews. And we'll go there again because I'm going to share again with you. You didn't hear before. I want you to hear this. When I pastored in the 1970s, uh, not far from Clemson, a town where they have a university, 
Well, this deacon of mine that loved to go out and witness with me to lost people in the community, one day said preacher, and that's what they call pastors here in the south of the United States, preacher. Said preacher, he said, can you, what, what is it about this Hebrews 10? That the guy at work, he's a member of a holiness church, and he said, you can uh, sin willfully and lose your salvation. And he goes to Hebrews 10 and verse 26. And for it says, if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Well, he said, that guy said, you, this means you lose your salvation. Well, you remember the context of Hebrews. Hebrews is addressing three different groups uh, of Jews. There are those that are uh, Hebrews that have recently been saved. They have received Christ as Savior, and they realize that the Old Testament sacrifices and all the ceremony of the temple in Jerusalem point to Christ's ultimate sacrifice that fulfills all those different sacrifices, whether it's the trespass offering, the sin offering, the bird offering, you name it. Whether it's a bull, a goat, a, a pigeon, a dove, whatever. And so it, it is a situation where the, uh, they had received Christ. But then there are those that had joined up with the Christians and were considering the Christian message. They were hearing that Christ was the fulfillment, but they had not yet embraced salvation. And then there are those that had rejected the truth that had been preached by the born again Christians to them as Hebrews, and they had rejected it. Well, that would fit in this context. They willfully sinned. What was the sin? They had received the knowledge of the truth, and they had rejected Christ's sacrifice. And so there, he, he, Hebrews says, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. You reject the ultimate sacrifice for sin, and you don't have any other options. You, these ceremonies won't cleanse you. Only the blood of Christ will. And so he said earlier, if Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And Christ, he's better than the blood of bulls and of goats, because he's the fulfillment of it. And so he goes on and says, you're looking at judgment coming at you. And so I showed him the context of Hebrews 10, and that satisfied him that we can't lose our salvation. And that man in the hole in his church had a misunderstanding of what the context of Hebrews 10 was. And, you know, we have to take people to the context of the passage. That's an important thing to remember. Many times false teachings come out of a context. They take one verse out of its context, and it becomes a pretext. Somebody's put it this way. A text out of its context is a pretext. And you think about that. A text of scripture out of its context becomes a pretext or a presentation of something that is not true. Now, free will is different though, because the free will people believe that it has to do with your will. That's why the term free will is stated. You can choose with your own freedom to receive Christ, but if you come to a point that you no longer want to be a Christian, you no longer want to be identified with Christ, you can reject. Christ and re reject him as your savior and take yourself, so to speak, out of the hands of God. Well, what are some of the passages they would use? Well, they would say that Judas, and so let's look at John chapter 13 today. Let's go to John chapter 13, and they would take passages that have to do with King Saul or Judas, one of the number of the 12. Now, what I'm going to say to you here today, my belief about Judas, he clearly was a professor to be a follower of Christ, a disciple, but he was not a possessor of Christ. Because the scripture indicates in Acts 1 and other passages that he did not go to heaven. 
Okay, so here we are in John chapter 13. And you remember the context. This is the context where Jesus washes the disciples' feet and he's going to celebrate the, his own last supper with them. And it says where Jesus washed the disciples' feet in verse five, after that, he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them, towels were with his girded, and then cometh he to Simon Peter. And Peter saith unto him, Lord, hast thou washed my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do, thou knowest, not now, but thou know hereafter, you shall know hereafter what I'm going to be doing. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my heads. And Jesus said, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean. Now, this is kind of like a, a, him saying, you're one of mine. You belong to me. And this is like fellowship being broken. I, you've gotten dirty in the world, so I'm going to cleanse you because you're going to need regular cleansing. But is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. He says, you've been cleansed initially by forgiveness. But he says, for he knew who should betray him. Therefore, he saith, you are not all clean. Jesus declares right there that Judas is not one of his that had been cleansed and had received forgiveness. Judas had never repented. He had never come and said, I've got to have forgiveness from the Lord. So I don't believe Judas was ever saved. But sometimes people will say, Judas, here he is. He was saved and then he rejected and turned on Christ and went against him and betrayed him. So he lost his salvation. They once again will go to Hebrews 6. And let's go back to Hebrews 6. Remember the context. There are three groups of people that the author of Hebrews is dealing with. And by the way, you do that, men. Women, you teach a ladies Bible study. You ladies, you men preach. And you get in a congregation. You've got three kinds of people sitting there, usually in most of your services. You've got those that have already received Christ and are in the family of God. They have sonship. But you also have people sitting there that are considering whether they're going to receive Christ. And they need to be encouraged to go ahead and take the knowledge of the truth about Christ and embrace it and receive him as Savior. But they are in danger if they decide not to receive him that they have rejected the only sacrifice and there'll be no sacrifice for their sin ever. That'll take care of their sin. Church membership won't do it. Baptism won't do it. Uh, joining a church won't take care of it. A ceremony, taking the Lord's Supper won't do it. None of it. But then there are those that have already rejected and made up their mind. Well, in Hebrews 6, He's trying to address the group that has already received Christ and exhort others that are near it to go ahead and receive Christ. Because he says, you're immature. In the previous chapter, he's talked about they're not being able to handle the meat of the word, but only the milk of the word. So he's addressing some of these Hebrews that are immature Christians. They're believers, but they're not going on to further doctrine that is going to do teaching that will help them grow and just get out of the basics of the Christian life. You know, the basics of being a Christian is God's son died in my place. I repented of my sin and embraced him as savior. And that started me and I'm at first base. As we talk about, and you, you talk about going in cricket to a certain place and back, all right? <laughs> We talk about in baseball and American baseball, going around the bases. You go to first base and then you try and get to second base. Then you go to third base, fourth base. And fourth base is home plate in American baseball. Well, in cricket, you wanna go down and back, right? <laughs> exactly. You don't wanna just get down, you wanna get back, okay, to, to score. 
well, these people had just gone to the first place and they were staying immature. And here's what he says, therefore, leaving the principles or the basic doctrines of Christ, let us go on under perfection. And that word perfection doesn't mean sinless perfection. Perfection here has the idea of word mature, be developed, complete. That's where he's been addressing in the previous chapter. You're not maturing. You're not developing. It's just like I have a 16-year-old grandson, and he has developed out. He's 16, but now he's grown to over six foot three and weighs over 200 pounds, and he's strong. But he's got a brother that's 13, and he's only about five foot eight. And he hasn't grown up to height of his brother. He hasn't matured out. Give him time. Let him eat more of good food, sleep, and he'll be like most teenage boys. He'll grow up and be bigger than his grandfather and his father. And that's exactly where my uh, two oldest grandsons are. They're 16 years of age, and they're two and three inches, four inches taller than I am. Okay? And... But give the 13-year-old time to take in good food. And that's exactly what he's saying here. Take in the meat of the word. And he says, go on unto perfection or maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance. You've already repented from dead works. You, rep you, you repented from works that couldn't save you. They were dead works. And you put faith toward God. You know, you've already done that. You've already placed your faith in Jesus Christ and of the doctrine of baptism. And, you know, you you followed the Lord and believers baptism, laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead. You've come to believe in that and eternal judgment. You've already faced that up. He says, now go on. Don't stop there. These are the foundational doctrines and don't lay the foundation again, he says. And then he goes in and says, then this will we do if God permit, if it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Now, what does it mean to be partakers of the Holy Ghost? That's where people get into a problem. Well, they participated in the teaching and doctrine of what the Holy Spirit of God was saying. He came and the Holy Spirit illuminated their minds and said, you've got to repent of trying to be saved by works. And you've got to turn to Christ and Christ alone, because he's the only one to be saved through. And you must take him to have your sins forgiven. They had partaken of that. God had convicted them. This is what we would call verse four. Not conversion, but conviction. So if you could put it down by this verse, he's speaking here in the context of this other group that they're considering whether they're going to receive Christ. But Christ's spirit, the Holy Spirit, has been convicting them or convincing them that Christ is the answer for their forgiveness of sin totally. And the Holy Spirit has shared with him. That means to be partaker or fellowship, partaking of the same thing. And what is it? The same truth that the Holy Spirit teaches everyone because it says the comforter will come and he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. The Holy Spirit had been telling these people you are in sin. You have not believed upon Christ, and you need to do that now. And so they had partaken of that. They have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. The Holy Spirit had come upon them in powerful conviction. If they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him into an open shame. So what did they fall away from? They fell away from the very fact that repentance and turning to Christ, the crucified one, is the way to be saved. And they, they, can't, they can't be brought to a, re, a point that they feel like they need to repent. If you turn down Christ, then there's nothing else for God to offer you is what he's saying. Because repentance that I've tried to convince you of and convicted you that you needed to repent, you wouldn't step over, so to speak. 
You wouldn't step out of this circle of religious dead works, trying to work your way to heaven through ceremonies and the Judaism and step over into this other circle. Here's this circle and they wouldn't step over. They'd come right to the edge and they'd been convinced by the spirit of God that Jesus was the one but in light of the persecution. Now you folks experience that in India. You have people that they know uh, that if they make a decision for Christ, their family's going to reject them. For years, my wife and I went into the summer times into Mormon territory. And this is a dominant area of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Some of those towns, the people in them are 95% or 98% Mormons. And if you come and receive Christ and say, you don't have to go to the temple in Salt Lake City and do works in the temple, then you are no longer a part of us. And they will sometimes threaten them in the past, their lives. Sometimes they'll socially kick them out of their family. Sometimes they will stop going to their business and doing business with them. You understand that in your context in the Hindu and Muslims areas dominated. This week, I spoke to a Muslim man at one of our stores where I was looking to purchase something and he's from Delhi. And I, I would like you to pray for this man because I'm gonna be following up with him. His name is Imam and he is a Muslim that comes from Delhi. And he, uh, has in his family some Christians and some Muslims, but radical Muslims, radical Hindus are going to attack even their own family members. Jesus said that in Matthew 10, your own family is going to turn against you. If you receive me, he says, there, I'm, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. There happens to be a division like a sword divides a body whenever someone receives Christ. And see, this is what these Hebrews were facing. They were facing Holy Spirit conviction and convincing. And they had to make a decision to convert. And some of them said, no, the persecution. I might lose my life. I might lose all of my property. They might burn my house. Hebrews 12 talks about the fact that that already happened to some of the believers that Paul, I believe, was the writer of Hebrews addressing. So he goes on, he says, go on, make the decision, step over, make that decision, because God has been pouring his word like rain into your hearts. And that's why he goes on to verse seven, for the earth which drinketh in the rain, that cometh often upon it and bringeth forth herbs meat or fit for them to whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from God. But he which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned but beloved we are persuaded better things of you things that accompany salvation though we thus speak he says though i'm speaking real strong to you that you're going to come to a point where you're going to be cursed because paul didn't know who was saved and who wasn't saved because there was a group of those that said yes we're believers and there was a group yes we're identifying with Christianity, but they hadn't really made the decision to receive Christ. And so he's saying, if you reject Christ, the reign of God's word is going to bring forth briars. And that's to be burned and cursed. So that's what this whole passage is. But then Paul goes on to say, he says, but I think most of you are saved, truly saved, and that you're not going to face that judgment because you're trusting in Christ. You stepped over into conversion, not just conviction. In verse 10, he says, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Some of you have taken care of these persecuted believers, your brothers and sisters in Christ. You identified with them and they're being put in jail. They've had their goods taken. They've been beaten. And God's not going to forget how you've taken care of those persecuted people. He won't forget it. Boy, this is one of my favorite verses. 
Hebrews 6, 10, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work, not for salvation, but the work that you show toward believers because you're a believer and toward his name that you minister to the other saints and do minister. Hey, that's a great verse for us pastors, isn't it? This is a devotional thought that came to me one day. I was saying, I'm ministering to people, God's word. I'm laboring in his word. I spend effort to meet their needs. God is not going to forget one time, one minute, one hour, one situation, one group meeting that I've ever done to minister to his people. That's encouraging. God, will he's going to reward us for ministering to his people. And we des and then he goes on in verse 11. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope under the end. He says, come on, demonstrate that you're really one of us. Go all the way to the end. Don't turn from Christ, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. He says, there's perseverance. The true believer is going to persevere. And I would put by this verse right here, perseverance. The condition of true believers is they will endure to the end and get all of the full blessings of God and rewards in serving him. But coming back to it, free will people take these passages and say, hey, these people once received Christ and then they rejected him. I believe they were convicted of Christ. They never did receive him. And therefore, they were never converted. They were never born again. And so that's what this passage, I think, is the answer to it is you've got two, three groups once again. And he's making a strong pill to the second group. You've been convicted, but you're not converted. Some of you, you need to step over and receive Christ and be converted. Okay, denominations that hold this position are free will Baptist. By the way, 1 Kings 8 through 31, uh, even Thiessen in his book says King Saul was this individual. He was an uh, individual that was never saved. He wasn't born again. But the free will people would come and say, yes, he was converted, and then he turned his back on God. Now, denominations the hold of this position are free will Baptist, the Church of Christ, and the Christian Church. Now, when I say Christian Church, this is a denomination in America. I don't know if you have any of these churches in the U.S., but this is actually the church that I got saved in, is the Christian denomination in my hometown. And they believed that you have to receive Christ, but then you have to obey him and observe all things, whatever he's commanded. Or if you reject his teachings, Christ's teachings, and don't obey them, you will be lost. You're rejecting him. You're rejecting Christ. That's why they baptized me right away is because they believed you had to be baptized or you would not ultimately be saved. So this is Christ plus something else that they put on to it. And if you don't do it, then you're rejecting Christ and thus you will not stay saved. And so Catholics and Mormons have forms of this. You're one of them. But if you come ultimately and reject the teachings of the Catholic Church and forsake the church, forsake the Mormon teachings, you're forsaking God, and thus you are going to be judged. In fact, in the Catholic teaching and in the Mormon teaching, those that go to hell and just don't go to purgatory for a little while and stay in hell forever are those that were once Catholics that rejected the Catholic Church. Mormons are like that. If you look at their three uh, heavens, levels of heaven, they have the best Mormons there. Then they have good people that go to the second heaven. And the third heaven, they believe, is where wicked people go that didn't have any religion. And then hell, the fourth compartment of judgment of God, is for the devil and his work angels, demons, and for Mormons that apostatize from the Mormon church, they go to hell. So these religions will say a form of the free will position. Now, let me just say this. 
Are there free will Baptists that are saved? Oh, yes. But their view is that you probably won't lose your salvation, but it's possible. And I had a friend uh, years ago when I was in college, and we did some work together. But he was from a free will Baptist. And I asked him, I said, Gary, do you really believe that you can lose your salvation? And he said, well, he says, it's, it's not probable, but it is possible. Now, yeah. I, I, I just said I, I, I couldn't take that belief. And so the free will view believes that a person can receive Christ by choice of free will and be saved, but when then by free will can choose to reject Christ or God. Those people would go to hell because they were no longer children of God when they rejected Christ, whom they had once received because they had rejected him. Once again, Hebrews 6, I believe people that ultimately reject and turn from Christ and said, I'll have nothing to do with him anymore. I don't think they ever really were born again. Uh, because I believe if a, per, a Christian comes to that point, we're going to look in the next eternal security position that God deals with them in three ways. And we're going to look at now at the eternal security position. And I'm going to quote some verses. You remember John 1.12. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And the word power in the Greek there is exousia, and it has to do with the right or the authority. I have the right or the authority to be a child of God. Okay, and then John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So whoever believes on Christ, it's promised should not perish. That means should not go to hell in the future. That says he that believeth not is condemned already, but he that believeth, he is going to not perish. Why is the person that he did not believe is condemned already because he believed not in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So the issue of whether you're going to perish or have eternal life is believing on the name of the Son of God. And so verse 36 of John 3, we want to go and look at John 3, 36. I think this is another good passage that we need to take a look at. John 3, 36. Here at the end of this uh, chapter, he says, he, uh, verse 35, uh, the father loveth the son and hath given all things into his hand. So what is he talking about? All things into his hands. Well, he that believeth on the son hath everlasting life. So Jesus gives us eternal life. That's one of the things that God the father's put into God the son's hands. And he that believeth not the son shall not see life. And the context is everlasting life in this verse, not just any life, physical life. He's talking about eternal life, the everlasting life. The son shall not see eternal life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So the wrath of God is hanging over his head now, and then he gets saved. It's taken off. But then when he dies without Christ, not believing upon Christ, he will be judged. Then John chapter five. There are lots of good verses about a security of the believer in uh, John's gospel. He says in verse 24, and by the word faith, belief, or believe on is mentioned about a hundred times in John's gospel. I run into people and they say, well, I've, I've never been saved. And I, 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 I'm not sure that I believe the Bible. What I challenge people to do when I run into them that, I say, listen, if you have you ever read the Bible? No. Well, it's got errors in it, they say. No, I said, you haven't read the Bible. You don't know for yourself. And if you're really wanting to know how you can get a relationship with God and know whether the Bible's true, I'd encourage you to read it on your own. And then I challenge them to read Genesis 1 through 10. It gives them 
the creation, the fall, and the corruption of man, and God's judgment in the flood, and the Tower of Babel, you could uh, have them read chapter 11. And then I said, and when you read, just to say, God, if this is true, would you make it real to me? And then I would encourage you, if you're a person that loves drama, read John's gospel. All I'm asking you to read is 31 chapters of the Bible. Because these are the chapters of the Bible that are going to show a person how to be saved. And then I say, if you're a person that likes logic, read Romans 1 through 10. And that's 41 chapters that I encourage them to say, you can read a chapter a day in about 10 minutes and get the meaning of it. And you just ask God to make it real to you. You know, there are people that get saved just by the word of God doing that. And But here's what we're looking at now. John's gospel is the belief gospel. It presents Jesus deity, the son of God to the whole world but with a purpose to believe. That's why John 20 verse 31 says, uh, there were many things that John said I could have written about, but the whole world would not contain the books of all that Jesus said or did. But these have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God. Why? Did you believe upon him that Jesus is the Christ and that you might have life through his name? So this book was written for that explicit purpose giving the eight miracles in this book to prove that he's divine. But he says, verily, verily, in verse 24, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And notice that word hath is a present tense verb in the Greek. It's a present possession. You have everlasting right now. Now you and shall not come into condemnation in the future. So there's the present condition. I have eternal life because I'm believing upon him right now. The future, he hath everlasting life, shall not come into condemnation. So he's saying blanket out in the future. You're not going to be judged of God, but is passed from death unto life. And this is spiritual death unto life. And the word past is in the what we call the perfect tense in greek and it has to do with something that happened in the past that's why ed is on the end of it. past from death unto life yes and that can be an aorist tense that does that as well but what he's driving at here would be continuing in life continuing in life, having it go on and on. So in the past, I passed from death, but I'm going on in life is literally what he's trying to drive at. I have that everlasting life presently and it'll continue, continued idea of the verb. So there's that one. And then we wanna to go to verse uh, 29 in this chapter. And he talks about in verse 28, marvel not at this for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. Now, some people will take this verse and say, there it is. You have to do good in order to go to heaven. But really what in this verse he's doing, he's identifying those that are believers by their works. Faith without works is dead. So a faith with, that doesn't work and doesn't do good is not a possessing of Christ's faith. It's a professing of Christ's faith, but it doesn't possess him. And so you don't have a changed life and you're not doing good. And so keep that in mind. He, he, sometimes the writer will come and throw in, like in Romans 2, he brings out doing good but he's saying these are the characteristics of a believer. And so the characteristic, those that have the characteristics of a believer indicates they're true believers, they're gonna have the resurrection of life. They that have done evil, they are showing forth the characteristics. They were not a believer, they didn't have spiritual life and so they weren't changed. They had continued in sinful works and they're unto the resurrection of damnation. So it's important to clarify that. 
And then we go on to say, John chapter six is a good one. John chapter six, and we're gonna look at uh, verses 37 through 40. Uh, and it says, well, verse 36, he, Jesus has just proclaimed that he's the bread of life. And he says, you come to me and you eat of me, you'll never ha have hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst because uh, he's the water of life and the bread of life. Verse 36, but I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. So he's addressing some unbelievers in this large group that was gathered that day. He says, all the father giveth me shall come to me and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So anyone that comes to me and receives me, I says, I'm not gonna cast you out. He says, I want you to be aware of that. And for I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the father's will, which has sent me that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. He says, I'm not gonna lose you. You're permanently mine, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. Once again, and will I will raise him up at the last day. So he's saying, you believe on me, you, you will have good works if you have true faith, and you're going to be raised to the resurrection of life. You're not going to be resurrection of damnation if you believed on me. Then we want to go on to chapter 10, chapter 10 of John's gospel. John 10, verse 27 through 28. It says here, and he's the good shepherd is the context of this passage. And the good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. And he says, but is some of you believe not because you're not my sheep in verse 26, as I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So a uh, true believer is going to listen to God. He's going to know what God is saying and he's going to show that he's a follower. And I give unto them eternal life. So it's a gift. This everlasting life is a gift. It's not an earned wage. And they shall never perish. So he says, never, absolutely, never have destruction of hell. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now, some people say, well, I can pluck myself out of God's hand. He said, he didn't say everybody except yourself. He says, no man can pluck them out of my hand. My father, which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. So Jesus is saying, they can't be lost from me. They can't be plucked out of my hand. And they can't be plucked out of my father's hand. Uh, so this is, a, this is an imagery of having a possession in hand grip, saying, God has me and no one can pluck me out of hands. So man came to an end of his and says, you're so sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die. How is that possible? I mean, do you think that you can hold on to God forever and live a, a life where you don't lose hold of God? He said, it's not about me holding on to God. It's about God holding on to me. He's the one that's holding on to me and he won't lose me. Praise God for that. Hallelujah today. It doesn't have to do with me holding out or holding on. As some people say, it is God holding on to me and can, no man can pluck a believer out of God's hands. Now, this leads us to Romans chapter five, Romans chapter five. And we're going to go. Go to a couple of passages. It says, as you, you remember this, he, he's talking about uh, verse six, for when you, we were yet without strength and due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Uh, 
He says, for scarcely for a righteous man would die, yet for adventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. He says, but God, in contrast, we weren't just good. We weren't just strong. We were weak, bad, and sinners, criminals in the eyes of God. I don't know if it's ever struck you, but God views every one of us before we're saved as criminals. Uh, we think of criminals as being people that break man's laws, but we're breaking God's laws. We're criminals. We deserve to be thrown into the prison of hell and the key thrown away. That's really what it amounts to. Uh, but it, it says, but God, in contrast, commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, Paul was writing that in his era, and he said, I, while I was a sinner here on earth, Christ died in my place. That word for us means instead of me, in my place, substitutionary death for us. Then he goes on and says, if he died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. Remember, now we have the righteousness of Christ and we're pardoned. That's justification. You shall be saved, delivered from wrath through him, saved from future wrath, hell, the judgment of God. So he says, if God loved us as while we were yet sinners, and he justified us and pardoned us already, and he's given us Christ's righteousness, <laughs> he's certainly going to save us from hell in the future. And then he goes on and he adds on to it. For if when we were enemies... Criminals and enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. We've experienced reconciliation. And we were once enemies. Now that's been changed. You remember, reconciliation means to have a change of relationship from being an enemy to friends. That's what we talked about, reconciliation. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled. We shall be saved by his life. So the death of the son reconciled us, justified us. Now his life, resurrection life, <laughs> we're going to be saved out in the future. We're going to be delivered. We're going to have everlasting life forever, Rex. resurrection life forever. I love that passage. But my favorite passage is Romans 8 when it comes to all of this. And we're going to spend some time later on in our next session, next Friday, in this passage, because it speaks of the Trinity. This passage in Romans chapter 8, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the, what they called the Prince of Preachers, over a century ago in London, he had the tabernacle church that he preached in, and he was preaching uh, without amplification, without a choir, without musical instruments uh, being making the service is something great he just preaching he would preach to six or seven thousand people every service he'd have different people on sunday morning and then sunday evening the prince of preachers charles haddon spurgeon said in the bible romans chapter eight is the golden ring that we put like on our finger, the golden ring of the Bible. And he said, and not only is Romans chapter eight, the golden ring, but Romans chapter eight and verse 28. And that section is the diamonds in the golden ring of the Bible, the jewels of the Bible. And so here we have it. He's talking about what the Spirit of God does for us. He helps us pray in verse 26, and he intercedes with groanings which cannot be uttered. And then he goes on to say, and he shows us the, the mind of God in verse 27, and he knows the mind of God. And then verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. These love God are people that are saved to them who are called according to his purpose. So God called us to a purpose. And what is that purpose for whom he did foreknow? He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So right here, we have the start off some great truths about God, the Holy Spirit and God, the Father.
but he comes down through this passage and he just adds on thing after thing when he says in verse 30 for moreover whom he did predestinate that mark out beforehand that they would be called by him and be called but not only called but be justified and these are past tense errors they are saying this is in god's mind already happened we're justified but we're not only justified as believers right now we're glorified in god's mind we're going to be glorified it's a done deal it's as sure as past tense and i have in my bible next to this verse past tense our glorification is already as well as done in the mind of god and it's going to happen and no one's going to change that you're saved today you're going to be glorified in eternity and god views us that way well what's his purpose what shall we say then to these things if god be for us who can be against us hey, if god's our savior and we're in his family no one can stand against us uh, no one can take us and put us into condemnation before him because he goes on to say he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things do you remember remember this as an argument from the greater to the lesser in human logic in paul's times the philosophers would argue from the lesser to the greater and from the greater to the lesser and what he's doing here he's saying if god did this and i remember a friend of mine we were headed to australia and we stopped in colorado at a church in 1970 and we were both in college and we were going to go help missionaries in australia that summer for 11 and a half weeks and I was sick and I couldn't preach that night, but I was so, not so sick I couldn't go. I was having appendicitis attacks. And I still went to that service and my friend, my best buddy in Bible college preached that night or that day. And he said, you know, we look in the Bible in Second Peter 2 and we look in Jude, uh, uh, Jude and we see that the angels that sinned god spared not but delivered them over into chains to be judged and then we see sodom and gomorrah god spared them not those wicked people they deserve to be judged and he said we say amen to that noah's generation he spared them not those wicked people and spared them not and then he says and then it comes to us folks and we're wicked sinners and what does it say about us god loved us so much he spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all now folks that's an argument if god wouldn't spare his son but would kill him for us certainly he would give us smaller things than his son he didn't spare his own son he'll give you justification he'll give you glorification he'll give you ultimate salvation and that's exactly his argument so i want you to think about it we're going to have a break time i think it's break time let's take five minutes break and uh, we're going to start back with revelation i mean sorry romans 8 32 think about it he spared not his own son but delivered him up first all how shall he not with him also freely give us all these smaller things like justification like glorification like reconciliation like resurrection you name it smaller things because he's given us the greatest thing he could give to begin with jesus well we'll we'll be back in about five minutes all right men